Hello, my name is Alex Isles, and in today's episode, we're going to be looking at some of the female deities on Hadrian's Wall. So, welcome back. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at four deities, and alongside that as well, a group of goddesses and who are quite interesting and are found in northwestern Europe. So those four deities are Victoria, Fortuna, Minerva, and Diana, and then at the end we're going to be looking at the Matres. So those are the gods we're going to be looking at. Why not we jump straight in with Victoria? So right here we've got two statues of Victoria or Victory. Both of these are from Hadrian's Wall. One can be found at Chester's Roman Fort and the other one is at Housted's Roman Fort in the centre of the wall, both of which you'll be able to see on the map right now. Now, when we're talking about Victory, you probably know her in day-to-day -day life a little bit better by her Greek name, Nike. And that's also because of the connection with the trainers. The gentleman who was creating Nike trainers at the start, he wanted to give it a name that people would know about. And so he chose the Greek name for the goddess of Victory. And when he chose that name, he wanted people to think, well, when I wear these trainers, I'm always going to win. Obviously, today, not everyone is classically educated. And so because of that, not everyone knows Nike in a Greek form, but the name Victory you're probably well attested to, or you at least know the concept of Victory, which is her Roman name and now gives us the concept and the word that we use today. She started off as a Sabine goddess, Vacuna, and then over time was adopted into the Roman pantheon and became Victory as we understand her today. She was a major goddess for the Romans and she was associated with triumphant generals. So whenever a general had won a war, he would come back into Rome and when he came back into war, Rome, he would venerate victory. And that was a very important aspect of the way that the Romans viewed the world and their interactions with the world. She differed slightly from her Greek alternative Nike, who was actually seen a little bit more as a goddess as a goddess for athletes, for sporting events, that sort of thing like that. So when she's the goddess of sporting events and athletes, you can think a bit more like the Olympic Games, those sort of competitions, chariot races, that sort of stuff. But the Romans venerated her very much as victory in war, and they venerated her on coins, on jewelry, on architecture, and inside of houses as well. And it wasn't uncommon within Roman houses that on the frescoes and the paintings on the walls, you'd have victory in the corners to represent the spirit of victory, and she was quite an important deity. Later on, people would say that that has mutated to become the symbol of angels that we see in Christian art later on. But Christian angels are quite separate for the concept of victory, but you do see victory still continuing right into Renaissance art and into modern art as well, and you can see her around the place as well. With these depictions of victory, you can see this one from Housteads. She's standing on top of the globe or on top of the world, and she would have been carrying a scepter in one hand and a laurel reef in the other, which is how she's normally depicted. You can see the scepter on this side from Chester's, but her other arm has been lost, and when her other arm has been lost, you can't see the laurel reef. But that was another thing as well, so the laurel reef, which was associated with victory, would be held over triumphant generals' heads as they returned back into Rome, and so that was associated with victory there. So these are the symbols that she's normally associated with. She's standing on top of the globe, she's holding a scepter in one hand and the laurel wreath of victory in the other. Let's move on to the next goddess, Fortuna. So here are some depictions of Fortuna from Segedunum Roman Fort on Hadrian's Wall. And the first one we'll look at is this one right here. This is Fortuna from the commanding officer's personal bathhouse within the commanding officer's house at Segedunum Roman Fort. You can see she's depicted as a Roman lady, and then she's holding a very, very large cornucopia, or horn of plenty. And these horns of plenty would be full of flowers, vegetables, and fruit. And so that was something that was associated with her. Fortuna herself was associated with fortune and luck, but also had a fertility aspect as well, and she would be responsible for the protection in some ways of granaries and of grain and of food as well. So she was all rolled in together. When you see her in some depictions, she's associated with a ship or a, a ship's rudder, but more often than not, when you look at her depictions on Hadrian's Wall, she is depicted with the cornucopia, the horn of plenty, which we've just talked about now. Alongside being associated with plenty and all of those sort of things as well, she was also seen as associated with the virtues. And so fortune 
uh, Fortuna would also be associated with the Wheel of Fortune and the fact that at any point in time people were even increasing in fortune or decreasing in fortune and she could be seen as both good and bad luck. She was also associated with state figures or politicians because at certain times if people had chosen to listen to fortune then they were seen to be good statesmen but also if they were not listening to fortune then they would be bad statesmen and therefore have bad fortune and therefore have bad things happening while they were ruling or controlling. So she was a very important goddess, not only within the aspect of protecting crops, protecting food um, within a, a civil society or within a, a, a complex, so like a village, a town or a fort, but she was also seen as fortune as well. Very interesting thing about her on Hadrian's Wall and in many other places, her shrines are often found outside or inside of bathhouses. So this particular depiction of Fortuna was found in the commanding officer's bathhouse. We're not entirely sure why this is. Is it because people are worshipping her when they're inside the baths? Um, uh, for instance, uh, Lindsay Allison Jones, quite an important um, academic on Hadrian's Wall, she suggests it's because people feel vulnerable and you want to be protected while you're on the bath. Um, other people have suggested because the fact that in the bathhouses people would play dice and luck games and so they're wanting to venerate her for her aspect of luck there as well. Well, just not entirely sure why she's associated so much with bathhouses. On this side right here you have another depiction of Fortuna and this is a small personal shrine owned by one of the soldiers at Segedunum Roman Fort and so you can see it would have had two doors which would have been closed and then opened whenever he wanted to worship. A little bit like how we see uh, Maximus's character in the film Gladiator with his little own personal idols of his family and the little gods that he brings out when he wants to worship. The soldier here in this case would have had his own little Fortuna that they would have brought out and worshipped and said thanks to, thanks to them being able to close it up and then maybe transport it to another location or with them as well. So there's a depiction of Fortune too. Let's have a look at some of the shrines depicting Fortune from Hadrian's Wall and the Antonine Wall as well. So right here we have some of the almost day-to-day -day depictions of Fortuna. What we saw just before was some of the more high-end stuff. So obviously a commanding officer with his little bronze icon of Fortuna, that's going to be a bit more high status or a bit more impressive than what the normal soldiers have. So when we're looking at it right here, we've got a Fortuna from the Antonine Wall, which can be seen in the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow. She's got an absolutely massive cornucopia of the Horn of Plenty. And then she's also sometimes associated, as you can see just down here, with a wheel with a number of spokes coming off. That's often seen with Hellenistic gods as well when they're represented on Hadrian's Wall. Another side right here from Chester's Roman Fort, we've got a very, very similar depiction because you can see there's the round ball there, which could be a globe or just like in the other one, it could be a spoked wheel. She's got the cornucopia and in there right here we have the actual deity herself. You can see her name on the altar and then at the bottom you can see the inscription and it was set up by a German soldier on Hadrian's Wall and that can be seen at Chester's Roman Fort. So again, two very similar depictions of the goddess, both showing her with the cornucopia and also a small little thing which could be a globe or also a spoked wheel. Then right here we have the one from Newcastle. Now I like this one a lot because again, we're seeing a very similar Fortuna. She's got her hair and ringlets around the side of her head. She's got the cornucopia over one shoulder. And then in the other hand, it's a little bit harder to see, but she's taking a container which would probably be like a pan or a small little dish and she's pouring out a, a sacrifice a libation a drink offering onto the altar right there you can see the little altar right here and she's pouring it out upon it so this altar has been set up maybe as someone who is petitioning fortuna to make a um a sacrifice on her behalf and she is then taking that and is accepting that altar or sacrifice and so here again we've got the depictions of Fortuna. She's wearing a long dress in all of those occasions and we can see she's always got the Horn of Plenty. So the soldiers who are worshipping Fortuna up on Hadrian's Wall, when they're dedicating to her, they always see her with the Horn of Plenty. She is providing for them. So maybe that's to do with the grain supplies, the food that they have, or the various different needs that they have as soldiers on the wall. 
It could also be the fact that they are um, seeing growth within the location, they're more economically prosperous, and they're developing the Roman settlements around the wall, which we can see within the Vicus, the civilian settlements, outside the walls growing. So an interesting one viewing that. There also could be the fact that they are taking Fortuna and comparing her to native goddesses. Because, for instance, if we have the German uh, soldier here, he might actually be viewing Fortuna within the light of the, the German goddesses that he knows back home. And we also don't know who's made these two here. Is this uh, a legionary who set up this Fortuna and therefore is worshipping her? Or is it an auxiliary soldier who again is worshipping her for her prosperity? Oh, and this one here who's making an offering from Newcastle. Is this a native soldier? Is this a, a soldier from all over the, uh, you know, the German or the Gaulish part of the war? Because we know the soldiers stationed at Newcastle were German soldiers. There's so many different ways of looking at these. And that's another thing I love, that the person who's worshipping it may have a totally different understanding of what they're representing and what they're wanting to show of the goddess than we understand from the classical attributes of the deities that are often depicted. And so I love showing these ones here because contrasted to the, uh, to the commanding officer's Fortuna, who is very, very classical in her depiction, we see these more crude versions, but are just as faithfully dedicated than the commanding officer's Fortuna. And so these ones may have been in other locations around Roman forts, around bathhouses, and they're petitioning the goddess for something that she can give to them and provide for them in their daily lives. Now we're going to move on to the next deity, Minerva and her depictions. So Minerva, we've talked about her in the first episode when we talked about the Capitoline Triad, the three most important deities in the Roman pantheon. Now when we're looking at Minerva as well, she's the goddess of wisdom, but she's also seen as an important goddess in regards to defensive wars. So whereas Mars is seen as offensive wars, she is seen as a goddess of strategy, of stra planning, trade, and also victory in her own aspect as well. So when you've got this wisdom goddess, obviously you can see how she's depicted within the classical sense. So she's wearing her long dress, she's seen as athletic, quite strong, and she's normally associated with a spear and shield as well, as she is depicted in war garb, and she is a warrior deity as well as being a wisdom deity, a strategy deity, all of those other aspects that she's associated with. When we're looking at the Minervas, who were depicted on Hadrian's wall and on the Antonine wall as well, what we have right here is this one. And again, you can see it's still Minerva. She's got her shield at, she's got her shield at her side, which you can just see down here, a big curved shield as like the very much the Hellenistic shields that they would have had. And then on the other arm, she's got her spear. In the centre of her chest, you can see a little face. And if we look at the classical Minerva just here on her chest, there is the depiction of the Gorgon, which obviously would turn men to stone. So in this crude of depiction, they've still got the Gorgon in the centre of her chest. So they know that this is Minerva, but this is a more crude depiction. They've carved into the stone and then it's been put up somewhere. So this someone maybe is not very uh, wealthy. They're not a very high status individual who can afford a very public display of a high status classical uh, Hellenistic depiction. But they still know all the aspects of what Minerva is supposed to look like. So they've carved her out and they've made a dedication to her. And it's those as you've probably heard from other episodes, those day-to-day -day life depictions of the gods that I find most interesting when we look at them because these are done by ordinary people who have their own desires and they are wanting to gain some of the power of that deity right there. And so that's one is really one I enjoy of Minerva. Here we've got a slightly more expensive depiction and this is Minerva from Corbridge. It's a part of a larger depiction it's where she's depicted as the patron of Hercules. So when we looked at the episode on Hercules, you probably saw her in the bottom left hand corner of that statue. Again, we can see her with her Hellenistic helmet on her head, but you can't really tell her normal love of depictions other than that. And so what the person, the historian or the art historian, when they've looked at it to try and figure out who the god is, they've had to understand it within the context of Hercules. So Minerva helped Hercules through his tasks and therefore this female depiction beside the statue is probably going to be her. But again, we've got that helmet, just as you can see here, the classical helmet on the top of her head. And so that's how we can understand it's Minerva. 
and so normal day-to-day -day people on the walls are actually are honoring this goddess with sometimes very simple depictions of her like this one here and other times they're able to commission more fancy ones which will show an aspect of the goddess that they're wanting to draw out either mythologically or for their favor as well. What we'll do now is we're going to move on to the next deity, Diana, and have a look at her depictions as well. So now we've moved on to Diana, who was a hunting goddess. Now Diana, she starts off as a goddess of the countryside, and it seems that she is almost entirely adopted from the Greek Artemis. And so when we have that, we obviously have seen before that within the Roman pantheon, there were already gods and goddesses who covered the woodland areas, such as Mars and Sylvanus, but they adopted Diana um, as a god and they used Artemis's mythology as the important part of, as the new understanding of this deity. So when we're looking at this deity, we have to understand her very much within the Greek context. So on this side right here, we can see her as she's depicted. Right here, we've got in one hand a bow. She's reaching up from arrow from over the top of her shoulder so that she can quickly fire it off. She's wearing more um, a, a shorter dress that enables her to move more easily as a woodland goddess. And then there's the stag, which is one of her animals. And we'll come to that in a second. On the other side here, we have a very interesting depiction of Diana as well. And I believe this is Diana because of um, a part of mythology. Now, for a long time, if you come to the Great North Museum in Newcastle, this depiction is on the wall and they say this is a depiction of Venus bathing with her nymphs. But recently I was listening to a talk and it's very similar to another depiction in Germany. And when I've looked at that depiction, I have to agree that I think that this is actually Diana. And this is because in mythology, Diana was bathing one day and there was, and this is mentioned in, in Ovid's Metamorphosis, that there was a Greek um, hero called Actaeon. And Actaeon was going along and he stumbles across this river and he sees that um, Artemis bathing. When he sees her bathing, she is so embarrassed that she transforms him into a stag with a shaggy coat and antlers. And then he is actually hunted down and torn to pieces by his own dogs, which again shows the vengeful nature of the Hellenistic and also the um, Roman deities. These gods were very dangerous in their own regard as well. And so I think this is the scene just beforehand where he hasn't yet stumbled through it and it's from High Rochester in Northumberland. Now I think this is, makes a lot more sense because of the fact that this was in wild Northumberland and you'd probably want to have a hunting deity on side. It was a part of a system which contained water and when it's a part of a system containing water you can imagine people seeing the goddess Diana and going well we're going to go out to hunt later or something like that and we want her on side and so they venerated Diana rather than Venus who is a water deity as well but in central Northumberland it's quite a distance away from the sea from water and so that's why I sort of air more towards a hunting deity rather than actually thinking of it possibly being the goddess of love who we've uh, mentioned before in a previous episode. So thinking about those different ways of how we look at these altars and these shrines, when they're depicted, these can also link into other stories as well. And so when we look at Ovid's Metamorphosis, I think this is Diana rather than it being Venus. And so this again is another depiction of Diana from Housted's Roman Fort. And you can see her very clearly right there as a hunting deity. And so she was responsible for the countryside, the wild places. She was also responsible for hunters and also the crossroads as well. So as a deity of the crossroads, you can imagine wherever roads crossed, you would set up a small altar to Diana as well. And she's quite an important goddess because she also, within her aspect of being responsible for the moon, was also a goddess of childbirth as well. So you have to wonder, are the soldiers also venerating her for their wives and their children outside the fort and for the continuation of their family line as well? So another interesting one when you think about gods, you will sometimes take them at face value as maybe just like a hunting goddess, but she's also a goddess of childbirth. So she has an important element in that too, alongside Juno and alongside Aphrodite, the Matres. And now we're going to look at some very interesting goddesses, the Matres, who cross over between the world of spirits and goddesses and are a very interesting group of female deities as well. So right here we have the Matres and the Matres 
are very interesting because sometimes they can be depicted as three female figures together or they can also be depicted as a sole female figure on her own and so this may be a single female uh, deity and then on the other side we have the matres as represented three together sometimes people say oh it's the, the sorry the daughter the mother and the crone uh, three aspects of woman's life but in most often the matres are depicted as like mother deities who are responsible over childbirth over womanhood over the life of women as well and are seen almost as fertility and household deities as much as anything else they seem to come from northwestern europe and are adopted from gaulish and germanic traditions and it would be very important as you have to think of the soldiers on hadrian's wall about two-thirds of them come from gaulish or germanic backgrounds so when you're looking at the matres you have to understand them within the context of these um, areas they're also probably for the safety of women they're probably for the fact that the women have gods as well that they worship and there would have been important practices involved in that when it comes to matres they're often depicted holding things so these things can be a combination of either children um, they're also associated with baskets of fruit with uh, fertility symbols sometimes interesting enough stuff like snakes and also alongside that children's diapers so a combination of different things reflecting different aspects of life that they could be holding but no more often than not stuff like for instance a basket of fruit is represented with the mates on this side here we have a very interesting one because this mate is a very a crudely carved one and she was actually found in the Mithraeum at Crawborough or Broccolita Roman Fort and she was sat on top of this uncarved altar now a Mithraeum is a very interesting place to find a matre or a female deity because Mithras's worship was incredibly masculine. Women were not allowed inside the cult and it's also a secret society cult. So you have to get in and you have to raise up the ranks. So there's a number of different um, sort of questions about how she came to be there. One of them is possibly as the Roman Empire Christianized, the cults were shut down because there were even no worshippers anymore or they were being closed down by the state as Roman emperors made it illegal to worship previous gods. So because of that, one of the possibilities is that this here, this mate, was actually um, just being worshipped within the fort but they were now closing down the cult so they needed a place to put her so they took her inside the Mithraeum just before it was destroyed and they put her down there on top of her altar and as they put her down on top of her altar the Mithraeum was collapsed covered over and then lost to time and so somehow we have this female deity who's managed to sneak her way inside a very very male controlled secret space and then is discovered later on by archaeologists She's cool in her own way because what we have here is she is crouched down. She's holding a container in her hand and what you can't see from the angle of the photo that I've taken is that there's actually a depression in the top and then she's crouched down on top of the shrine. So it's likely that she was just about to pour out a libation, sorry, pour out a libation or a sacrifice on top of the shrine that she's standing on top of. So again, it's a really cool one where we've got this little female deity or icon that is now making a sacrifice on behalf of the worshipper who has actually created it in the first place. And then it's been used for a while and then hidden away in a place before they can be made destroyed or made illegal in its own way. So there's a cool one right there looking at the matres and their responsibility over women, over childhood, over their responsibility for the female nature of worship in the Roman world. I really hope you've enjoyed this video looking at some of the female deities on Hadrian's Wall and that you've been able to understand a little bit more about the different aspects of these goddesses and how people would have worshipped them in and around Hadrian's Wall and the rest of the Roman Empire as well. Please write a comment in the area below and we'll have a chat about what you think about them. As always, please do like and subscribe, share the videos with your friends and if you're really interested as, and if you would like to, I also have a Patreon where you can support me further as well. But until next time, look after yourselves and thank you so much for joining me and I hope you join me for another video in the near future. Until then though, stay safe and well and thank you very much.